Hello everyone, this is Aaron from Makers on Tap. The guys and I want to improve the show, but we aren't sure which areas need improvement. In the show notes below, there is a link to a two-question survey where you can let us know how we're doing and what we can do to make the show better. It doesn't require any kind of sign-in, just click the link and let us know what you think of the show. Thanks. Welcome to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff. Tonight, I'm your host, Joe, and with me are Aaron and Devin. And what are you guys drinking tonight? We'll start with Aaron. I have a Necron 99 from Three Floyds. Got all kinds of fun beer from Three Floyds. Yeah, um, it's an IPA. There's no additional explanation on it. It says, peace wants love. Wants free hmm. will help. Threefloyds.com. Interesting. And it's got a robot wielding a crossbow and some like hybrid shotgun sword. Neat. It's pretty neat. I want yeah. a shotgun it's, sword. It's really good. It's a pretty bog standard IPA. It's hoppy. There's no really interesting flavors that jump out at me, but it's very standard. All right. It's very good. What are you drinking, Devin? Uh, I am. Uh, I have a nice little cup here full of uh, single estate tequila ocho. Um, Ooh. Tequila tends to be my favorite type of beer, so that's what I tend to gravitate towards. I, nice. I, I rarely hear of the tequila beer. <laughs> yeah, you got to ask for it special to keep it behind the counter. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, tonight I'm drinking a little crazy from Revolution Brewing. It's a Belgian style pale ale, and I haven't opened the can yet, so I can't tell you what it tastes like. So that's fun. All right, so to just jump right into it, Devin, who are you? Why are you here? So I'm Devin Wolf. I'm the co founder and president of the Akron Makerspace, and like Joe, I have an obsession with buying and selling tools and equipment. Yes. Yes, and you'll fit right in. That we'll we'll tell the story of uh, the the funny little CNC lathe that we met over a little later. But um, a tale is old to... as time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to start, we have a couple news topics. Um, the one that I'm excited about: uh, Prusa Slicer 2.0 dropped this week. And you'll notice it's got a slightly different name. It's no longer Slicer PE. That was one of the things they changed. Most of this is some pretty big UI changes, uh, but it did come with the release and the final shipping of the uh, Prusa SL1 SLA printer or masked SLA printer. They're finally in the hands of non-beta testers. And um, so they released uh, Prusa Slicer at the same time. So both of those things are really exciting. And uh, River City Labs actually has a 3D printing meetup this week. So if you'd like to come out to our 3D printing meetup, uh, you should do that. And I will have my SL1 there so you can like poke it and stick your finger in resin and then lick it. Resin eating. That's the only way to test a proper resin. Yeah, that, that's how you know it's good. Resin eating, not condoned by Makers on Tap. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. So with this Prusa Slicer update, it looks like they have deprecated the Prusa Control. Yeah, what it was um, Prusa software. Control? I have no idea. Prusa Control was Slicer PE Noob Edition. Mm. So like everything that's in there boiled down to... I just want to hit print. Okay. And that's what that was. And they they essentially deprecated that and rolled it into this. Yeah. And I think that's Yeah, cuz they added smart. like a beginner version or be, like yeah. a beginner mask yeah, so, into this. Yeah, so with the new Prusa slicer they have a beginner, intermediate and expert UI uh options and based on which tab you select um will either hide or expose different options in your uh, UI. It's pretty neat. I, I think the 
the one change in this that I'm probably the most excited about is support blockers. But the like, support blockers are cool, and Kira's had them for a little while. Uh, but now Prusa Slicer has support enforcers, which is like custom supports with uh, Simplify 3D, except for I don't have to click nine gajillion times. I just make a box that like encompasses the area that I want to make sure I have supports with like stretchy arrows, like I'm scaling something, and then I click go. And then it, it like it's like, hey, you wanted supports here. I heard you want supports here, so I'm going to put supports here. And that's pretty great. That's such a better user experience than clicking 9,000 times in Simplify. Do you hear me, Simplify 3D, with your bad <laughs> interface? Moving on. Um, hmm. I heard fun things are happening in Akron, Devin. What's going on? Yes, they are. Um, so as of last week, we just signed our lease with our new location. So we're just kind of a standard run-of-the-mill maker space. Uh, currently, we're sitting in about 4,000 square foot. Um, and so right about, you know, like four times the size of River City Labs. It's standard <laughs> run-of-the-mill. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's three uh, and a half times. Well, imagine <laughs> if if River City Labs or River City Labs had uh, four times the space, but then all of your tools and equipment jammed into it. So. It feels it feels a lot smaller, um, but yeah, we've we moved out of our garage, we moved into a small warehouse, and then now we're in a, our own building. But we're moving in back into a shared warehouse um, because they have offered us a a really good deal on ten thousand square foot. So we're wow. gonna take it. Oh shit! Yeah, and it's wow. It's a neat building too. It's the former BF Goodrich Tire Plant. And we nice. we found some old signs when we were renovating, and it's actually the the area where they did they wound all the cords for the tires. So there's some neat bit of history with it, and it's just a monster facility. And like most cities with giant monster derelict manufacturing buildings, they're trying to breathe new life into it. So there's uh, a couple gyms in there. There's two breweries in there. Um, there's a, a oh, shoot. bunch of amenities in the area because it's uh, our building's a million square foot and there's eight buildings. Oh gosh! Yeah, wow. so they're trying to find you something have two to breweries do with that. in house. Yeah, it, it's wow. it's. Oh, I will say we thought we had it nice with a brewery two doors down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I just take the freight in-house. elevator. Yeah, I take the elevator downstairs. That's amazing. Oh, man. Yeah, I can't wrap my head around a million square feet. It's a very big building that's six stories tall. <laughs> oh my god! Oh jeez, I've been in a lot of really big industrial buildings, and like, I guess I've never just I've never had the number of square foot put in front of me. So maybe that's why I'm having trouble wrapping my head around it. But wow, okay. So what kind of deal did you get? Is it purely just money, or did you get like, is it like partially donated or? Or how how'd that work for you guys? So federally, they cannot donate rent unless it's a what they call like an appreciable, you know, chunk of the building. So since we're subleasing a small portion of a gigantic building, they can't donate rent. So they just we they just scored us a pretty good deal because Akron is the rubber city. This is where synthetic rubber was founded. You know, we have BF Goodrich, Firestone. Um, Obviously, Goodyear's uh, located here, and then we have a bunch of other tire companies that have headquarters here. So um, this there's there's a ton of these just gigantic facilities in the area that they're knocking down every year. So they're trying to find some use for them. So we there's just a surplus of of square footage in our area. A couple of years ago, we talked a little bit about you guys moving into a tire facility. Is this the same facility you were looking at then? Uh, same complex, but a different building. That building is actually controlled by another nonprofit that we were trying to strike up a deal with and things didn't work out. So this is actually a for-profit that's just like, yeah, we'll just give you cheap rent. We don't want anything else. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Simple enough. Yeah. And they knocked down a couple buildings. So we have parking for like 400 cars and yeah. Oh man. 
So when are you going to have the Akron Maker Fair in your your maker space? <laughs> <laughs> so currently, we're partnered with the local library system to run the Mini Maker Fair in uh, the main branch, which is like a mile down the road. But uh, we'll see if they're willing to do it because it's there's a couple other maker based businesses in the in the building. So on the same floor, we have a couple artists, we have a couple furniture makers, and then uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of Tiny Circuits. They build tiny yeah. tiny Arduinos. Yeah, Ken Burns is at the end of our hallway. So oh, nice. Yeah, he's one of our first members. He's been a big supporter of the space since we started. So um, it's really nice that uh, he helped us get out of the garage, and now we're right down the hallway from him. So Very cool. Let's dive into uh, the story of how we ended up talking a little bit, because <laughs> we we talked a little bit about this before the podcast, and then you, you mentioned something, and I was like, oh, I have a story. So... Uh, Devin and I ended up bidding on this little Rhino CNC lathe uh, against each other. Uh, <laughs> and um, we... How, how did we end up talking? I'm, I'm trying so to remember. I run a group for Makerspaces called Makerspace Equipment Connection. Makerspace Hackerspace Equipment Connection on Facebook. Um, yeah. and I had posted about it and you had said you were bidding on some things and I was like, what are you bidding on? <laughs> yeah. That and, lathe was super cool. Like, yeah. It had like a five tool turret, it had a through spindle, had its own little CNC controller that was like an external box and now a computer controlled thing. Although it probably would have become Linux CNC controlled had I gotten it, but neither here nor there. Yeah. And it happened to be local to me, so I actually went and took a look at it and grabbed some photos of it, and I was like, uh, hmm, maybe, maybe not a good idea, unless you love retrofits, which you do. I do. I really do. Uh, but I do remember a very, like, pivotal moment in that whole conversation where I realized I was winning, and I realized I was probably going to win at a fairly significant amount of money but i had kind of got into that like bid cycle and i was like i'm gonna win and then i was like oh no i'm gonna win <laughs> crap <laughs> <laughs> and it's like six hours away and I'm like how am i gonna go to akron on the day and like load this thing up because it wasn't it was little but it wasn't super little um but so it's made by a company called rhino which ended up being local you right uh they're about four hours away but they're in ohio okay um but you said they closed yeah so i think it was right before or right after that auction that that auction that we're talking about right now happened to be just a local high school that actually got a big grant and they were updating all their equipment so they're just getting rid of all their old stuff but okay. i was looking and i had just missed the rhino cnc um auction where they auctioned off like a dozen of those lathes and like Man. the parts lathes were going for like 150 bucks non-working and the working uh, ones were just going for under a thousand man that's so frustrating so um my my story i got one of their robotic arms <laughs> from caterpillar it's under my workbench right now and uh it's functional to an extent i got that robot arm for 50 bucks <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I, I I've seen them for sale on eBay for like three thousand dollars. Jeez! And when I got the robot arm, I I looked up the serial number and everything, and I actually emailed Rhino because they were still open at the time, and uh, they're like, "Yeah, you can totally buy the software to run that robot. Uh, you'll need Windows ninety five, ninety eight at the absolute latest, ah! and a." <laughs> A uh, license for the to, for the software to run it is seven hundred dollars. Uh, would you like us to invoice you? I was just like, no. God damn it! No, I I don't want you to invoice me for seven hundred dollars. <laughs> so uh, I'm I keep saying that I'm waiting for my daughter to get a little bit older until she's old enough to like dig into this robot. We can build it together. And I'm running out of excuses because she's the perfect age to do this. <laughs> Did you ask them to point you in the direction of where you can buy Windows 95 for your robot arm? <laughs> I, I, I sure didn't. Uh, I didn't want that discussion to go any further. I found a lot of projects where people have 
written MATLAB scripts and Python scripts to interface with the controller because it's it's just a parallel port based controller and um, it's got a, a sweet little touch pendant. And I've got the robot to power up and I can move all, it, I think it's got five axes on it. I can move all five axes and everything works, which is amazing because this thing was bought in 1985 by Caterpillar for like an instructional program. Like they gave me the whole history on it when I emailed them. They're like, yeah, it was bought by so and so and uh, they were going to use it for this and like somebody found it in a scrap tub and they came and found me and they're like, Hey, do you know anything about this robot? You do robots. And he's like, no, I don't know anything about it, but I want it. Let me know when it leaves the building. And, uh, it took a whole bunch of calls to get in touch with the, the scrapper, but he's like, yeah, I think I paid 50 bucks for it. Give me 50 bucks for it. And I was like, yes, yes, I will. When can I come? <laughs> Perfect scrapper voice. <laughs> Yeah, man, dude, dealing with this guy, like I, I made like three different appointments to meet with him. And every time he's like, oh, yeah, my, I, my dad and I, we had to go pick up this thing. And then one time he's like, ah, oh, yeah, I, I'm still playing in this pool tournament. I thought I would have lost by now, but I'm doing real good today. So I don't <laughs> think I'm going to be able to beat you. <laughs> so you see. So your your impression sounds like Scooter from Borderlands. <laughs> oh jeez. Who is the the scrapyard guy? Oh man. That's it's, why that's like, why it sounds so fitting. I, I think they ma- modeled him after this dude. It was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're uh that big about robot arms, um if you ever make your way out my way, we have five industrial surplus complexes cuz we're like the heart of the rust belt. So we have a local supplier that on their website, they just have a button that just says robots because they have a whole aisle of (laughs) industrial robots. And we ended up buying, it's like a Cartesian based arm. Uh, So just regular X, Y, Z, the wrist rotated and the hand opened and closed and then lifted up and down. And uh, we turned it into a bartender at the space. Nice. Uh, <laughs> and it was like it was so great cool. because they it was just like the robot on the pedestal and they're like oh it doesn't have the controller or power supply so will you give a hundred bucks for it and we're like absolutely we'll figure it out we'll retrofit it and the bottom of the base was like extra thick and we cracked it open and it had a solid state controller in it and we nice. pulled out the what was it the um super memory card that had in it which was uh, uh i think it was 12 megabytes or no no it was 120 some k it was some ridiculously low amount of memory and we ended up uh just teach programming it how to mix drinks for us amazing yeah that is so cool yeah like that's i love it that's kind of my plan for this arm unless i can find somebody who has a really good software project because i am not a software guy but like the the teach programming on the pendant all worked when i used it last so Oh, you know, who knows what still works, but um, you know, it, the wiring's a little rough and needs cleaned up and it's got some rust on it, but yeah, I I, I think it could be a really fun little project. Yeah, we have a, a, a way too many industrial surplus places in our area, so that's why I get a lot of maker spaces that come to us to be like, "Hey, do you have?" and we're just like, "Yes. How many do you need?" <laughs> <laughs> I I need to come out there. I really do, because I, I feel like I would be like a kid in Playland. Yeah, we need you. You need a couple days because three of them are in Cleveland and two of them are not. So it's you. You need some time. That uh, that sounds like a, an incredibly fun vacation, and I one that I shouldn't go on for <laughs> my own sake, for my own sanity's sake. So before the podcast, we kind of talked about going to New York Maker Fair. Were you planning on flying or driving? I don't know. If I went flying, if I went to New York Maker Fair, I probably would go as a spectator, or maybe a spectator slash helper and not a maker, because uh, my first Maker Fair as a participant was Milwaukee last year, mm-hmm. and I had so much fun like seeing it from the the spectator point of view rather than the exhibitor point of view. I I think I'd want to experience my first New York Maker Fair as the spectator. 
Okay. Yeah. yeah. We go there to do Power Racing Series, which nice. if you guys aren't familiar, uh, which I'm assuming you are, you know, get yes. uh, kids Power Wheels cars, turn them into not kids Power Wheels cars. So we have awesome. uh, Optimus Prime and the Boba Fett Corvette. Um, <laughs> so last year we got a couple medals, but we're we're not the fastest at all. Um, we're we're topping out around 35 miles an hour, and there's many cars that just beat the pants off of us. So, but when we go, we you know we make sure we rotate out so people can have time to take in the event and enjoy themselves. Right. Awesome. Uh, I was watching people pull out of into straightaways, pulling wheelies in Milwaukee last year. So I can only imagine how fast some of these cars are going at the big events. It, yeah, the, their acceleration was insane. So the Akron Makerspace, how are you guys funded? So I would say that we're funded kind of more grassroots um, than some of the makerspaces we see out there. Um we are almost completely membership and class driven. Uh, we get very few grants. Um, we just happen to be lucky and be in a very cheap market for real estate. So we can we can afford to rent big swaths of land for a reasonable price. Um, but yeah, so we've honestly, uh, we're, we're floating, you know, depending on the season, 75 to 100 members. Um, we charge, you know, a monthly membership fee. We're piloting uh, hourly usage fees on the equipment, and it's just a sign-out sheet. Okay. We bill you at the end of the month. It's nothing crazy critical, uh, nothing like Aaron's RFID tool system. Um, oh, you've heard about it. <laughs> I listened to the podcast. Oh, I'm so flattered. <laughs> um And then we do a ton of classes. So actually... um Yesterday, we taught our uh, welding class, and we found that we can, uh, just by holding a couple welding classes a month, we can pretty much pay our rent. And most awesome. of those tend to be what we call tourists, which are uh, curious potential makers that come into the space, because um, yesterday's class happened to be all members, but usually it's almost never all members or any members. Um, because they'll get like a one-on-one -on -one real quick, like, okay, I've welded before, I know how to do this. Um, but we do a ton of sales. Most of our classes sell out within 48 hours of posting them online. Um, so we're kind of in a hungry market, and we just make sure that we're always posting on social media, we're always posting new events. Um, and then as we develop uh, new classes, we kind of pilot, you know, kind of ramp up the price until we find what the market will bear. Um, I hate to say we're starting to run a little bit more about like a business, but we make sure that it's all about the community. So we make sure that our our right membership fees are reasonable, our hourly rates are reasonable, um, and we really work with our membership to make sure it is what the you know membership wants to see. So um, we have rental benches right now because we have a lot of square footage. So we can uh, we can offer uh, rental benches. We have a connection for reasonably priced pallet racking. So we build workbenches into pallet racking. So on top of your membership, Ooh. you can pay a fee and then you get a pallet rack with a tabletop and a rack on top, a dedicated light over top your workbench and, a, and an outlet. So that's really nice. Yeah. I wish we had 10,000 square wow. feet. Wow. <laughs> yeah. so i'm just here like where the fuck are we gonna fit a pallet rack <laughs> well we get we get we have uh the bigger industrial pallet racks that you actually fit pallets on but then we get these lighter duty not quite pallet racks and they're only two foot deep and they make the perfect bench size because if you get too deep on a bench yeah. then it's really hard to you, you know if it's just one person you're up against a wall it's really hard to reach stuff so yeah. we do four by eight workbenches in the middle, and then we do shorter benches on the exterior. Nice. I like that a lot. I'm experiencing my first four by eight workbench in my own shop, which is like, it's far <laughs> too big. I'm in, I'm in the process of building a four by eight CNC. And okay. so my, my, uh, my machine table is a workbench right now. And it's far too big for my shop and where it's sitting. But at the same time, I can throw a whole sheet of MDF on top of it and saw it right now and i'm like oh, this is amazing because it didn't fall apart on me <laughs> yeah we yeah. we've always so even even at our current size of four thousand square it's split between a first floor and a basement and the basement's just like 
a dugout basement, so it's almost unusable. So the okay. floor the floors are wibbly and everything. Um, but we're so jam packed with Devin's equipment that we don't have <laughs> we don't have a lot of uh, open build space. And that's one big thing that the community's really been saying is like, listen, we have all the tools. We have so much crap, <laughs> but we can't use anything because there's so much crap. D- does your crap work? Most of it does. I have a CNC mill that needs to get, uh, it's getting a retrofit. Uh, I know you really love uh, Linux CNC, but I'm sorry, I can't stand it. Um, Why? Ah, I, I, I've, been, I've been in machines for 15 years. And Let's it, go into this. Let's go into this. <laughs> Do it. Well, so what are your I, thoughts? Listen, I, Devin is computer dumb. All right, so I need something that has a nice, pretty GUI, and setting it up is pretty simple, and I can throw a little bit more money at the problem due to the privilege of my day job. So I will do that just so I don't have to deal with learning uh, other skills that I don't find 100% necessary to daily survival. So... So I, what is what is your control of choice? What so we're choice? Um, getting ready to pull the trigger on a Masso. Um, about a year ago, they had a really bad rap, and I've been following the reviews, and after a couple big overhauls on their architecture, it actually seems to be working okay. The main reason I'm going for this is uh, the CNC router we have currently runs on, um, what is it running on now, uh, PMDX, and okay. that runs pretty good, but my CNC mill has a tool changer, so it's a ah. Benchman VMC 4000. So it's got a okay. four four position linear tool changer that it has to like move over and then actuate some air cylinders uh, to op- you know clamp and unclamp the draw bar and grab the tool and move away. So there's like macros that need to be written for it, and you could totally do that on Linux CNC. I just don't like Linux CNC, so instead of free, I'm going to pay six hundred and fifty dollars because I'm kind of dumb. Well, so the Maso is a whole nother world mm-hmm. that we honestly haven't even dove into. Like that's a DSP based, like, yeah, it's its own dedicated controller. Yeah. yeah it's an arm based system that's eh. fully controlled. Arm. Oh yeah. I said arm. So we'll, he, he likes I it. I see. So will the Mazo control the tool changer? Yes. Does it have the IO to do that? The, the, there's enough IO and there's when to set up the tool change routine. You just click tool change routine. Nice. <laughs> so I am paying for the convenience of setup and the fact that I, even though it's an Australian manufacturer, there's now um, an American provider that ships out of Florida and they sell on Amazon. So you don't have to pay the $75 shipping from Australia. Nice. And hey, we so, love Australian manufacturers. Hi, Dominic. So are, <laughs> you know, like, so are all we the love controls Australian upside down. Guys. They're, they're my favorite. Um, so, you know, whatever. But, I'm very interested in your experience with the Masso. Well, I will like, I will let you know once it comes in. I am uh so when we got it it was missing the missing the motion controller. This was an awesome auction find. Um mm-hmm. and they didn't sell the computer with it and it had a P was a PCI based motion controller. So I called up okay. a- ABB the controls division of Baldor that made the board and I was like hey I need this thing and they're like great we still have the pattern we can make you some you got to order 10 at a time and I was like oh how much are they and they're like ten thousand dollars a piece <laughs> yes <laughs> and I was like I'll call you right Did back they require and, Windows 95 <laughs> uh they ni- they'll do 98 I have the software for it too it came with the software just not the, the motion card so I started looking into different things and there's hilarious like you can go through a PMDX or a Pokies board and write custom macros, but like I said, I'm computer dumb. I just need something that works. So yeah. getting getting the Masso get looks like it's going to be very promising for us. Um, like I said, I'm only managing four tools, and I need like less than 25 I/O to run everything because yeah. it's it's fully enclosed. So it's got a door lock, spindle rate, feed rate override, cycle start, cycle stop, feed hold, all that fun stuff. So did Fanic have a uh, Fanic attack? Uh, oh, so God. so you're the fanic. A lot of people call it <laughs> fanuk. It's fanic. You got all this, but well, yeah, it depends. Because like, if you're talking to people on the CNC controller side, they call it fanuk. And if you talk to people who were introduced to it through the robot side, it's fanic. And if you talk to if you talk to fanuk, they say both. So yeah, yeah. I I. 
I can tell you for sure that everyone that I've ever met on the robot side says Fanic and that it's Fanic and that everyone else is an idiot. And the, everyone I've ever talked to on the machine controller side says the exact same thing, but with Fanuc. And it's it's it drives me nuts. <laughs> But yeah, uh, back to the the benchman. Uh, we're putting <laughs> yeah. we're putting that masso into <laughs> it, and since the uh, it, it's actually servo driven. So if you, you guys aren't familiar with the benchman CNC, it's uh, similar to the size of the Tormach 440. It's a little tiny machine. It's got uh, 16 by 6 by 8 uh, machining volume, uh, axis movement, okay. and um, the neat thing about it is one, it's servo driven. Uh, the encoders are incredibly, incredibly precise and it's got really nice brushed DC servos because the nineties, everything was brushed. Um, yeah, but the machine is made of cast, um, polymer granite. Like the entire chassis really? of the machine is granite. And huh. yeah, it's kind of weird. The table's obviously cast iron, but the, the whole, you know, Y axis chassis and Z axis chassis is all cast granite. Um, because these were built for, you know, colleges and laboratories. And when I called up Intellitech, which is now what the company is called out of Boston, um, I was like, hey, by the way, uh, I have the serial number. What, what, what did this thing sell for? And he's like, oh, yeah, well, this package was sold to this school. And da, 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 da. yeah, they paid $85,000 for that. Oh, my God. <laughs> ah. And I'm like, it's a three axis mill. And they're like, yeah. Yeah, it was the 90s, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm pretty sure the guy that I talked to with that Rhino robot said that Cat paid like $25,000 for that robot or something like that. Oh, my so, God. Yeah. yeah, I believe it. I'm it, I'm looking them up on eBay right now, and they're going, looks like six grand. Yeah. Like, like used, machine, used machine prices float kind of wildly. So Yeah, they do. And then we um, we ended up calling up uh, Gecko and getting some new servo drivers for it because the ones that came with it were unlabeled on what the readout or what the wire outs were, the pinouts. So yeah. it's like, great, cool. What does this mean? I don't know. Um, so we're going to maintain the same servos in it for now until we have issues. And then we'll probably switch to um, ClearPath servos. Are you guys familiar with ClearPath? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, those are great. I was down at, uh, this is another nice thing about being in Ohio. John Saunders at NYCCNC. Yeah. He's an hour and a half yeah. away. So oh, man. we usually car carpool to his <laughs> open house. So last open house he had in his location, which was two years ago, that clear path was there. So it was great listening and sitting, talking to the development crew for the ClearPath servos and just be like, oh, we want to put this in this. And he's like, okay, yeah, don't buy any of that. You want this cheap one. You don't need that bullshit. So <laughs> Nice. We should talk later about <laughs> servos. Um, so the, uh, the, uh, the Tormach uh, M servo upgrade, those are all ClearPaths. And yeah, the, yeah. So the, the MX are all clear paths. It it's weird though, because like you would think that clear that like servo upgrade is totally the way to go, but it, it's it the answer is like kind of it depends, right? Because they are picky on their RPM range and where they would work well, versus steppers that are are just kind of like yeah we'll go that's fine. Yeah, but then what you RPMs? Get... You get the nice closed loop system that you yes. know doesn't slip as much, and if it does, it compensates. So, yeah, yeah, it, it's a it's a weird trade off to figure out it, if you want servos or not, and like finding out that um, that kind of envelope that you can work in. Still, uh, I I had a, a few friends that own CNC router companies dive into whether or not they should switch to servos and for like the big cnc router tables they're finding that it was very very expensive to get the right servos to stay in the right rpm ranges for what they were trying to do yeah so getting it getting it specced correctly that's where i think once clear path that that whole system and not necessarily just that company but several companies get into the system of hey 
we're gonna help you spec everything right on our website without talking to somebody, give you pricing up front, but also sell you something that's pretty maintenance free and like their their servers are self tuning. So yeah, they are. once you and once you awesome. install them, you click self tune, you listen to the thing beat the crap out of itself for an hour, uh, and then you have a machine that runs nice and smooth and accelerates correctly. So I think once we get more companies in the game, the price will come down on that to where you're going to see a lot more of these small hobby CNCs, especially stuff you see that's crowdfunded, that will come out with great motion systems, not necessarily UIs or GUIs or controls, but, you know, they'll at least run smooth. Well, now we're starting to see kind of like the um, the all-in-one servo package like the ClearPaths, but from China. Yes. And they work really, really well. Um, uh, a guy, Ninja Robot CNC, he's he's at both NYC Maker Faire and um, Bay Area Maker Faire, and he was at Earth last year. That's where I met him. Uh, and that's what he was running on his little 3D printer CNC combo machine. Okay. And I was blown away at how well they ran, and they were like three times the cost of a stepper driver combo. So like, Oh, that's not bad. Not, well. not terrible. Um, yeah. I just, I haven't had the uh, the drive to to try to jump into that realm because they're, for what I need, they're they're still pretty costly. These were small NEMA twenty three drop in replacements. I need bigger NEMA twenty three drop in replacements, and they got a little pricier than I was willing to experiment with at the time. Yeah, so. I just, I just hope they don't have the same issues that like Chinese variable frequency drives do, which is um, you get it and it's universal, but uh, there's no instructions in how do you set the thing. Yeah. Luckily the internet's fixed most of that with those, the, how do you, the hauling VFDs? Yeah. Yeah. Whatever they are that come with the, you know, CNC spindles. Yeah. You know, my favorite part of those is now, uh, Linux CNC supports them out of the box for RS-485. So you oh. get a USB to RS-485 converter and two wires into that VFD, and it just supports it. And you can you know, M3 and spindle RPMs, and off you go. And it works really, 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 really well. Um, so to an extent, it's nice that those things are, are getting so ubiquitous now. Nice. But, so... This has been a great discussion on servo motors. <laughs> I have a question for Devin. <laughs> Gonna reset the conversation. Thanks, thanks, Aaron. Thanks for level setting. <laughs> so, uh, you you literally the Akron makerspace definitely seems to be you know three ish to five ish years ahead of RCL at your current state. How much do you see open source technology and software being used? in your space versus closed and proprietary software? So it seems like we've made the kind of closer to 50-50% closed source open source. And it, it just, we don't have a ton of people that have the ability and the combination of the time to fix some open source stuff or dev it how we need it to work. So there's some things that we've just outright bought um, things like we run Mach 4 in our CNC router, we run Aspire to program a lot of our CNC equipment. Um, but, you know, at the same time, we try to stay away from Joe's favorite, Gerbil. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you are a listener of the show. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we, we just try to... We try to choose what works for us because one thing that we found is as we grow more and more is we have less and less time to fix the broken things. So I just need the thing yep. to work. So if I can, like I said, I have the privilege of having a good day job that allows me a little bit of extra income to toss around here and there. And uh, if, if I can just toss like a couple hundred bucks at the space to fix a problem that's causing a couple hundred dollars in headache then we just do that. So, and then that allows us to like have classes on the CNC router without trying to get Linux CNC to work again, because for some reason someone decided to go into the parameters and change it for some, you know, reason. 
<sighs> That's never happened at River City Labs. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Why the hell is our yeah. acceleration set to this? What? Yeah, this... I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> And you know we we really do appreciate open source things. Like I said, we're we're moving in right down the hall from uh, Tiny Circuits, and they work on the Arduino platform, which is nice and open source. Um, but you know, like I said, we just try to do what works best for us because at the same time, we we still got to get the same amount of work done. And as much as I want to make the thing do all the things, I just want it to turn on. So it sounds like. You kind of have my take on it, which is open source where it makes sense and things that work where they make sense. <laughs> correct. Correct. I know. I know a lot of spaces tend to have their own kind of individual focus on skill or craft. Does the Akron Makerspace have a particular focus as far as what the majority of the membership tends to work on? Yeah. So... Despite my best effort to make everybody a machinist, uh, <laughs> everyone focuses on either woodworking, welding, or crafting. Um, we do have a pretty good contingent of people that are making custom circuit boards and, you know, working with a lot of robotics. But it, it tends to be, I would say, 60% of our membership comes in for woodworking. And then it kind of divvies up, you know, the remainder to crafting and jewelry making we do some blacksmithing uh but a lot of welding a little bit of sheet metal fab and close to zero machining even though we have three lathes so <laughs> that doesn't right. sound familiar at all <laughs> uh, what, what why do you think so, that is why do you, why do you think even though the machining capability is there the machining participation is so low so it's i think it's a couple different things it's the perceived difficulty of working in metal it's the perceived cost of working in metal and everybody's like oh well i'll just get a pallet out of the trash and have free lumber and they discount their time which isn't a good right. habit to get into um but you know, I my day job is in manufacturing, so I try to be really good about bringing, you know, bringing in any scrap that we can get for, like, dirt cheap. Um, whether it's through my work or through some metal suppliers in the area that sell us drops for almost nothing. Um, we tend to do a lot of our machining courses, like, kind of uh, on demand. Like, I get three people that say they want to run the lay. They're like, cool, cool, what are you doing on Saturday? Um, but it, it tends to be... A little bit of skittishness due to, oh no, uh, I've heard horror stories about lathes uh, and mills. To wood tends to be like that's what my grandfather used, or that's what my 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 dad did. So they tend to gravitate towards that. But once we get people into it, I like to say what Adam Savage always says is, if you can sew a dress, you can build a house. You know, once you learn how to cut and glue. A material, it's all just cutting and gluing. You know, are you using screws and nails? Are you using welds and bolts? So, right. you know, once once we get people in through the wood shop, then they're more apt to come into you know, put a part on the mill, put a part on the lathe, uh, weld something together, you know, bend some sheet metal, and actually get something put together. Yeah, I, I, I think a lot of it is just you know breaking that that initial maker barrier, which is kind of what you just said like once you get um making something in the space they're a little more apt to be like oh yeah i'll, I'll try that thing that's just outside my comfort zone yeah and, and most people kind of approach it like oh woodworking seems like it's the easiest and we monitor our hourly rate so when people sign up for when they use a piece of equipment not only do we use that chart to charge people we use that chart to monitor each piece of equipment and say, oh, wow, the bandsaws have gotten a lot of use this month. We should maintenance it. Or the drill press is getting a lot of use consecutively. We should probably look at investing in a second drill press so that people aren't waiting on stuff. And that's how we allow our space to grow organically. Like we we had a lot of people that, you know, they were like, we need a bike shop. We need a bike shop. We need a bike shop. Um, and... 
you know, Akron, Ohio is in the tail end of the Appalachian Mountains, technically out of the Appalachia, but we're pretty hilly. So bikes and hills tend not to work very well. Um, so we built a bike shop, you know, we spent like two grand, we got some basic bike tools, and for a year, our sign-out sheets didn't get filled out. So we downsized it. We're like, listen, we have no data to support it. You know, I saw maybe one or two people grab a bike wrench every once in a while, but they would misuse it on something else. And it's like, okay, well, these tools aren't being used for what they're supposed to be. So we're going to downsize this. So we've all but gotten rid of our bike shop right now because there's like four other organizations in our community that do the same thing. So we don't also have to do the same thing. So we monitor how people are utilizing the space so we can react to what our community wants, but also what our community needs, because they're not always aligned. Um, right. Yeah. That's and Devin has a problem with buying bandsaws, so we have too many bandsaws. But <laughs> <laughs> like yesterday, we we're prepping for this welding class. And then I look at my phone and I said, hey, I'll be right back. And 25 minutes later, I came back with another jet 14 inch bandsaw. Really? <laughs> yeah, so we have like you do. We have eight bandsaws at the shop right now. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> well, it's so bandsaws. Here's where we find the benefit to that. Not quite eight. Eight's overkill. I, I buy and sell equipment, so some of that is being sold, but um where we find having the benefit of duplicate equipment is not just for when equipment is, you know, there's a line to get into equipment, um, but also when I have a scrolling blade set on one bandsaw and then I have a rip blade set on another bandsaw. So you don't have to think. You just go to the bandsaw that says scrolling. You go to the bandsaw that says thick wood. You go to the bandsaw that says thick metal. You go to the bandsaw that says thin metal. And you just do your yeah. work. And I don't have to teach every single member how to change a bandsaw blade. I just make yeah. sure the, the bandsaw yeah, is huge. That. We just had an issue with a member like a month or two ago. Where oh uh, yeah, just roasting we had band one bandsaw blades. set up and then <laughs> they swapped the blade out. It was a brand new wood blade on it, and someone tried to cut metal with it. So uh, within yeah. a week, that brand new wood blade was super dull. Yeah, yeah, and our, yeah. our wood Sorry. shop guy was upset. <laughs> and yeah, so that's that's what we're trying to to get away from. Um, you know, I'm not gonna have multiple chop saws. I'm not gonna have multiple table saws. But things like. A bandsaw and a drill press. I have multiple drill presses. We have, like I said, multiple, multiple bandsaws. Um, we have lots of different grinders, lots of different sanders. So I've tried to make sure, like, we have sanders for the metal shop so they don't get full of sawdust and catch on fire, you know, and I have sanders in the wood shop. And I'm getting ready to set up kind of a plastic shop in a new space to where we have one bandsaw and one sander that's only for plastic because while you can get away with the wood stuff for that, you really do need to have slightly specialized equipment and it lets our members come in, be safe and be effective so they can come in and they can get their project done. And if they want to then stay, stay and hang out, like that's on them. Like uh, that's what we like. We have the community around it. We have the tools around it. It's not just the box of tools. Um, it's, it's the whole, you know, circle of making. So what do you think your, uh, what do you think your split with your members that are like, the I'm just going to come in and hang out versus I'm going to come in and get things done. Members are uh, easily 60, 40, if not a little bit more towards, I just want to come and hang out. And, you know, it, it definitely is people that want to come in and people that want to, Hey, what are you working on? And people that want to come together and do big group builds. So not only have we done like power racing series, uh, we built two cars for that. We're looking to build a third. Um, we just completed a, uh, magic wheelchair build, which is when you build a costume for nice. a kid in a wheelchair. So we did a six foot long, six foot wide X-Wing fighter. We did Poe Dameron's X-Wing, uh, from the new Star Wars series nice. and it's articulating wings, fully lit it, you know, um, has a smoke generator for the blasters and everything. It's pretty slick. Um, so we, we tend to have people that kind of come in and hang out. And then when those group builds come up, they come in for that. And then we, we get like these little splinter groups. Like we have a nice little blacksmithing group that they schedule themselves to come in on, you know, two days a month where they pull the forge out and actually start forging. And it's not part of any official, you know, 
event, but we're turning it into one because the obviously the membership wants to see that. You know, there there are eight to ten people that show up. You know, a couple times a month to come and just hit a couple pieces of hot steel. So we might as well turn that into an event. So we, like I said, we let the membership kind of drive how all that stuff goes. But we do get a lot of people that just kind of show up just to kind of hang out. Um, like today, I was at the shop doing some laser engraving for a local brewery. We make a lot of, we have a lot of breweries that reach out to us and they're like, hey, can you help us out with, you know, beer taps or tap labels or inlays for our bar? Um, and we want to support them and they tend to support us. So uh, we don't have a problem helping it out. Um, but then I had a couple of members that just showed up and they're like, Hey, what are you doing? And we sat and we talked about it and I showed them why I chose what tool path and, and how I can work to make it either higher definition or a faster process, depending on what I'm looking for. Do you guys take on jobs as a space then? Uh, we try not to, honestly. Um, I do kind of personally. And like I said, we have an hourly rate on the equipment. So like... Our laser cutter, we charge about 15 bucks an hour to run just because it, it makes sure it covers cost of the equipment, the maintenance, uh, puts a little bit back into the makerspace's uh, pocket. Um, whenever I take on jobs, like I said, I have a full-time day job. So if I take on jobs on the side, I will usually pay double the hourly rate to support the space. But we, as a space, we don't do like outside fabrication. We will only do it to support an organization that we want to support and something we have time to support. Right. That's kind of how we operate too. Yeah. We, yeah. We, we get a lot of requests for, I've got this widget. Can you help me make it? Yeah, not really. We'll, we'll, ha we'll be happy to help you teach you how to make it, but we're not going to do it for you. Exactly. But you know, we'll get, we'll, we'll get, we'll get somebody in who does something cool, you know, as a company, we're like, eh, you know, you're part of the local Peoria area. We'll be happy to help you with this one-off thing just for the benefit of being a partnership. Yeah, and sometimes those have paid off. Like, um, we had to reschedule the event from last year, but we're going to do it this year. Um, Warren, Ohio, we did some stuff for a local brewery, and they happened to be in David Grohl Alley. And if you know who David Grohl is from the Foo Fighters, he's from Warren, Ohio. So they have the world's largest drumsticks out there. And the brewery was like, hey, these are right outside our space. Do you want to help us, like, fix these? And we're like, absolutely. So we're working with the original artists that made these giant drumsticks. They're made out of telephone poles. Um, and we're working with a company <laughs> called Arbor Tech that makes power <laughs> carving equipment. And we're reshaping these um, power poles, these electric poles, because they've been walked up and down with guys and spikes. So they're really rough and people get splinters. So we were going to smooth them all out and get them all nice and stain them. So they look, you know, a little bit more like drumsticks. So we never would have gotten to do that fun, cool thing if we wouldn't have helped Modern Methods Brewing Company make tap handles. So that little bit of working with them helped support our space. You know, we volunteer our time. You know, no one gets paid here. And that also got us the connection for the city of Warren to, be, to have them come to us and say, hey, you guys do cool stuff. You want to do something cool, too? That's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That, that's my tie-in. FYI, I just opened. <laughs> so I, I was at the bottom of that tequila ocho. So I am opening up <laughs> uh, Tres Generoses Plata tequila and enjoying that with you all. Well, we're about the one hour mark. Yeah. Um. Do you have other things to ask, Aaron? I'm good. I got all my stuff out. Why don't we call it here, and then we can like do our outro, and then edit. Aaron can edit all this conversation out. Um, and then I'll totally do that. And <laughs> <laughs> maybe we can have you back on after <laughs> NomCon. Oh yeah, definitely. That's uh, 14th, 15th, and 16th. Yeah. And if we can. Just real quick mention that because a lot of people I'm assuming that tend to listen to this tend to be other makerspace peeps. Um, yeah. If you guys don't go to NomCon, you're really hurting your space. Uh, I went last year. I self-funded my flight to Santa Fe. Uh, I spent, like, it was pretty expensive uh, to go out there and fly and, you know, rent a vehicle and, and be out there for four days. Um, but there is a ton to be had by going to NomCon for your space. Um, there's all sorts of 
uh, workshops on marketing, on getting grants, on running big events, on, uh, you know, how to reach out to the local business in your area to support your space, um, all the way up to just hanging out with cool people. Um, last year was fun. You know, I showed up kind of in a, a day early with no real plans and Adam Savage showed up a day early with no real plans. So there was like a dozen of us that hung out for, you know, four days. And it's, it's, it's a cool time to just, you know, go to breakfast in the morning and sit down and just look over and go, Oh, Hey Adam, you know, Hey Devin. And you know, we're all talking <laughs> oh, about shit. stuff. So you guys really do need to go because there's a lot of cool makers there. You know, there's a lot of, <sighs> there's a lot of really good stuff to be learned. Um, and like I said, I got a giant Airbnb if you guys need a space. I had every intention yeah. of going, and then my wife bought me plane tickets to see my best friend that weekend. And I was like, I love you so much, honey. They this should come could've... to NomCon with you then. Well, I, huh. I'm not going to be far from NomCon. I, uh, I, I need to look at some things. So... Um, yeah. One thing I'll that I feel that. that they're not really talking about very much is they're in desperate need of volunteers. And if you volunteer, you get a discount on your tickets. So you don't have really? to pay the full price for the tickets. So if you come in and you you volunteer. Yeah. What was that? Do, do they have day tickets? Uh, I think it's the entire to the entire weekend. So okay. you can you can get an extra ticket for the Friday events. But the the regular tickets are for Saturday, Sunday. Okay. So um, the Friday night is, or the Friday day, uh, they're doing several tours of different establishments. Uh, Volkswagen has an innovation center there. There's a lot of uh, bigger maker spaces. A lot of those events are only $5 for those events. Um, mm. And then the rest of the NomCon, what a lot of people... Uh, aren't seeing is your ticket while a little bit of expensive you know it's it's sub three hundred dollars but still almost three hundred dollars that's your meals so you get oh. you yeah you get you get lunch you get uh you know breakfast in the morning it's you know uh at a nice place so you can go and there's plenty of room and this year they're doing a big sculpture last year we worked on the rosie the riveter sculpture for we the builders uh, yeah. This year, we're going to be working on the NomCon map with. Um, oh, nice! Yeah, with a bunch of other cool makers from New York that are that are spearheading that, and um, yeah, I think a lot of a lot of maker spaces really should highly look at doing it if you've got some members that are financially able to, or if your maker space is financially able to send at least one person. There's a lot of stuff to to get from it. You know, last year we got a lot of uh, we went to a lot of the inclusion stuff because as makerspaces, we tend to be, you know, majority, you know, straight white dudes. And it was nice to yep, yep. see it from a different perspective. And it was really nice to talk about marketing and doing press releases and reaching out to PR firms uh, and how to actually do the stuff. If you don't have the money to do the stuff, if you got the time and the the wherewithal to do the thing. So it and it was really good to get a lot of connections in, you know, the makerspace community to where you can talk back and forth with people and be like, hey, I'm having a similar problem that you had six months ago. How did you guys solve it to help me maybe fix my problems too? Hmm. You should go, Aaron. I'm gonna have to go. You should go. I'm I'm, I'm gonna look into it. Okay. Good. I feel like we need to go. <laughs> we need to go. <laughs> I'll hit you up, Devin. Oh, and I need to talk to you about your uh, RFID tool stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah let's you do. do that. Devin, it's been awesome to have you. It's so rare that I get to rant about CNC stuff with someone else who gets it. I'm going to have to make a trip out to Akron, I think. I should probably do that sooner than later. Um, do you have anything else you want to add? You beat you beat up non-con... You beat up Linux CNC isn't good, and I don't like you for it. Um, personal preference, personal preference. Yeah, totally. Uh, do you got? Do you have anything else you want to add before we uh, cut it? Just listen to your community. Do what your community wants to do. Don't um, don't assume that you know what they want to do. That's one thing I'm always learning every day. 
you know, I want to see this cool piece of equipment because I find it cool and then I put it in there and no one uses it. Um, so if you are running a space, just be like, hey, maybe my ideas aren't the best ideas. Don't that forget is, to... I don't believe you. <laughs> don't forget to take some time to make some cool <laughs> shit. Yeah, always exactly. keep making stuff. All right. Yeah, Aaron? This is the end of the podcast. Cast. 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 Cast.